Good morning, dear students. Welcome to our lecture on the subject classical and modern literature. So this uh, the second lecture, and uh, today's theme is the Middle Ages literature and uh, Geoffrey Chaucer. Before I start our lecture, I want uh, to introduce you today's plan. Uh, what we learn in today's lecture. Uh, the first history of Middle English, the second Saxon and the English language, the third Chaucer and its famous work Canterbury Tales. Uh, in today's lecture, we mainly uh, point out uh, Geoffrey Chaucer works and uh, his uh, famous works. And what is the Middle English period? And what does the Middle English mean, actually? So, mainly, Middle English period uh, was longer, 14th century until 15th century. The term Middle English literature refers to the literature written in the form of English, a language known as the Middle English, from the 14th century until the 1470s. During this time, the Chancery Standard, a form of London based English, became widespread and a printing press regularized the language. Between the 1470s and the middle of the following century, there was a transition to early modern English. In the literary terms, the characteristic of the literary works. Written did not change radically until the effects of the Renaissance and Reformed Christianity became most apparent in the reign of King Henry VIII. And according to the Middle English period, there were the three main categories. They are partly love, religious, and Arthurian. Among the many works, many religious works, are the Catherine Group and the writings of Julian of Norwich and uh, Richard Rowley. Also, after the Norman conquest of England, Low French became the standard language codes of the society. The Norman dialects of the ruling classes mixed with the Anglo-Saxons of the people and it became Anglo-Norman. And the Anglo-Saxon and a gradual transition into Middle English. Around the turn of the 13th century, Lyman wrote in the Middle English as the translational works were popular entertainment, including a variety of romance and lyrics. With the time, uh, the English language regained its prestige, and in 1362 it replaced French and the Latin in Parliament and the Court of Law. Early examples of Middle English literature are the Ermelum and Havelock the Day, the 14th century major works of English literature began once again to appeal, including the works of Geoffrey Chaucer. The latter portion of the 14th century also saw the consolidation of English as a written language and a shift to secular writing. In the uh, late 15th century, William Caxton for fifths of his works in English, which helped to standardize the language and uh, expand the vocabulary. In the Middle English literature period, uh, William Caxton's role in the development English uh, period was big, so he developed, uh, helped to uh, increase the vocabulary of English.
After the Norman conquest of England, the written form of Anglo-Saxon language continued in the same monasteries, but few literary works are known from this period. Under the influence of new aristocracy, Low French became the standard language of courts, parliament, and their polite society. As the invaders integrated their language and the liturgy mingled with that of natives, the Norman dialects of the ruling class became Anglo Norman and Anglo Saxon underwent a gradual transition into Middle English. Political power was no longer in English hands, so the West Saxon literary language had no more influence than any other dialect. Middle English literature is written then in many dialects that correspond to the history, culture, and background of the individual writers. So, while Anglo Norman or Latin was preferred for high culture and administration, English literature by no means did out, and a number of important works illustrate the development of the language. Around the turn of the 13th century, Lyman brought and wrote his uh, brood based on the West uh, 12th century Anglo Norman epic of the same name. Lyman's language is uh, Lyman's language is uh, recognizably Middle English, so his uh, president shows the strong Anglo-Saxon influence remaining. As the transitional works were preserved as popular entertainment, including a variety of romance and lyrics. With time, the English language regained prestige and in 1362 it replaced French and Latin in Parliament and the Courts of Law. Early examples of Middle English literature are the Omelum, Havelock, the Dane and the Thomas of Hills, Love Lune. In the spirit of time, the Mercian dialect uh, thrived uh, between the 8th and the 13th century and was referred to by John Treviso writing in the 1387. In the spirit with the, with the 14th century that major works of English literature began once again to appear, this includes and uh, so called Peel, Poets Peel, Patience, Cleanness, and uh, Sir Gawain, and the, the Green Light, Landland's uh, Political and Religious Allegory, Pierce Plowman, John Gore's Confession Amantis, and the uh, works of Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, it's uh, 14th century. Major works which is affected uh, to develop uh, Middle English uh, literature. Now I'm going to explain what is the mainly uh, peer means. Uh, in the Middle English period, um, it was the English poem that is considered one of the most important surviving Middle English works. Uh, it is included to other religious narrative poems. They are Patience and Cleanness and the Romance Gawain and the Green Knight. The second work is Pierce Plowman. Uh, Pierce Plowman is a late uh, 40 dream vision. The poem is a sequence of 22 dream visions called Patience which means step in Latin. In this vision, the narrator will meet the series of uh, allegorical characters. The poem is an uh, exploration of Christian faith as the narrator strives to uncover how to live a good Christian life. The third one is the uh, Confession Amantis. Uh, it's a poem that by John Gore was written between uh, 
1919. Go a contemporary and a friend of Geoffrey Chaucer and was a trilingual poet who wrote in three languages, the French, Latin and the Middle English. The Confession is a major work, Middle English uh, period. The poem was popular and in its own day it survives in 59 manuscripts which is a high number for the period. This uh, manuscript is slightly unusual in that it contains some illustrations. You see that uh, he given a book version of these uh, poems. Um, the first is Pierce Plowman by William Langland. Uh, the second is Confession Amantis uh, uh, Works of John Gower. It's a book version. In this period of time, the Kill the Poems are a rare example of Middle English literature produced in Ireland and they give an insight into the development of Irish English. That, uh, we cannot see um, kill the poems uh, a lot in a minute. Uh, we said that um, before starting the lesson uh, in a plan, uh, we will learn about Kaxan and the English language. So, what is the Kaxan and the language language? Kaxan printed four fifths of his works in English. He translated a large number of works into English, performing much of the translation and editing work himself. Uh, we have that above. Uh, Kaxan uh, helped to increase the uh, English vocabulary. And that Kaxon's role in the English development is big. Kaxon is credited uh, with printing as many as 108 books, 87 of which were different titles. Kaxon also translated 26 of the titles himself. His major guiding principle in the translation was his desire to provide the most linguistically exact replication of foreign language texts into English, but the Harvard publishing schedule and his uh, inadequate skill later often led to wholesale transference of French words into English and numerous misunderstandings. From these numbers here given, we see that uh, Caxton, Caxton mainly uh, pay attention to develop English language and uh, have a big role in a, a Middle English period. Okay, uh, let's continue. Uh, today's our main uh, main is uh, belong to Jeffrey Chaucer work. Before. Uh, have learned about Geoffrey Chaucer works. Um, I would like to show you a biography of Geoffrey Chaucer. <laughs> The outstanding English poet, Geoffrey Chaucer, renowned before Shakespeare, is considered the first finder of our English language. His Canterbury Tales ranks as one of the greatest public works in English literature.
Renowned author, Chaucer also contributed importantly to the second half of the 14th century to the management of public affairs as a courtier, diplomat, and civil servant. In a career that spanned three successive kings, Chaucer was praised and trusted, but it is his avocation, the writing of poetry, for which he is remembered. Geoffrey Chaucer was born around 1342, likely in London. His family name derives from the French Chaucer, meaning shoemaker, though Chaucer's father was a wine merchant. Chaucer's first appearance in historic records is in 1357 as a member of the household of Elizabeth, Countess of Ulster, wife of Lionel, third son of King Edward III. Geoffrey's father presumably had been able to place him among a group of young men and women serving in that royal household, a customary arrangement whereby families who could provide their children with opportunity necessary for courtly education and connections to advance their careers especially since Chaucer reportedly had 16 siblings. This was going to excel him in society. Though this meant Chaucer had to leave his family and work as a page in servant to a knight, he was only 15 years old. By age 17, Chaucer was a member of King Edward III's army in France and was even captured during the unsuccessful siege of Reims. The king himself contributed to Chaucer's ransom to save him in order to return him to his majesty's service. Chaucer surfaced again in historic record on February 22, 1366, when the King of Navarre issued a certificate of safe conduct for Chaucer, three companions, and their servants to enter the country of Spain. This occasion is the first of a number of diplomatic missions to the continent of Europe over the succeeding ten years. At the age of 25, Chaucer had moved from a household servant, a soldier, to that of a trusted diplomat. So much responsibility and activity in public matters appears to have left Chaucer little time for writing. However, the time traveling did expose Chaucer to the works of Dante, Petrarch, and Bocchiasso, which was later to have a profound influence upon his own writing. No information exists concerning Chaucer's early education, although doubtlessly he would have been fluent in French, as was the Middle English of the time. He also became competent in Latin and Italian. His writings show that he is closely familiar with many important books of his time. In 1366, Chaucer had married longtime friend Philippa Pan, a lady in waiting to the Queen of England, and continued his work for His Majesty as a diplomat. With Chaucer's career prospering and his first important poem, Book of the Duchess, becoming popular, Chaucer continued to connect himself with persons in high places. This first poem was more than 1,300 lines long, probably written in late 1369 or early 1370. It is written for the funeral of Blanche, Duchess of Lancaster, wife of John the Gaunt, who died of plague in September 1369. John of Gaunt was Chaucer's best friend. Lord, but mine heart is naked light, when I think on that sweetest right, a commonly one to see, and wish to God it might so he that she would hold me for her night, my lady, fair and bright. When Rich II ascended the throne, Chaucer was appointed clerk of the king's work. His pay raise was more than 30 pounds a year and a pitcher of wine daily. He became responsible for construction at Westminster, the Tower of London, and several castles and manors, but times were still hard for Chaucer. It was during the same time that Chaucer was caught up in a legal scandal. The charges were dropped and Chaucer was found not guilty, but regardless, Chaucer's place in society greatly changed. He resigned, or was removed, it is not clear, but Chaucer left the court and moved to Kent, after which his wife, Philippa, died due to poor health, leaving Chaucer with two sons and two daughters. Between the years of 1387 and 1400, Chaucer devoted much of his time writing his most famous work, Canterbury Tales, 
The humor of the work is sometimes very subtle, but is often broad and outspoken when compared to other works written at the same time. Chaucer's original plan for the Canterbury Tales called for two tales each from over 20 pilgrims making a journey from Southwark, England, to the shrine of St. Thomas Becket of Canterbury, England. He later modified the plan to write only one tale for each pilgrim on the road to Canterbury, but he only finished 24 tales out of the 120 stories is believed he had been planning. Chaucer introduces each of these pilgrims as vivid, brief sketches, a lively mix of a variety of genres told by the ta travelers of all aspects of society. The tale survives in groups connected by prologues, or introductions, and epilogues, conclusions, but the proper arrangement of these groups is not altogether clear. At this time in medieval England, literature was separated into very distinct styles, focused more on audience, the lower, middle, and upper classes, than its characters. Chaucer, however, moves freely between all of these styles, showing favoritism to none. He not only considers the reader of his work as his intended audience, but the other pilgrims within the story as well, creating a multi-layer rhetorical puzzle of ambiguities. Chaucer's work thus far surpasses the ability of any single medieval theory to uncover. Chaucer avoids targeting any specific audience or social class of reader, focusing instead on the characters of the story. The characters are written with a skill proportional to their social status and learning. Chaucer draws on his own unique background, knowledge, literary influences, and life experiences. The characters are all divided into three distinct classes. The classes begin with those who pray, the clergy, the highest of all of the classes in medieval England. Those who fight, the nobility, and those who work, the commoners and the peasantry. Chaucer also breathes new life into his female characters, giving them for a first time a voice as narrator. Until now, medieval literature only classified women as wives, virgins, or prostitutes. They were never given a primary role in a story. When Henry IV takes the throne, Chaucer hoped to find a new job under a new king. And while Chaucer's reputation for loyalty earned him a small pension, Chaucer went months without pay and was near penniless. Nevertheless, on the strength of his expectations, on the 4th of December, 1399, he released a tenement in the garden of St. Mary's Chapel at Westminster, and it was probably here that he died on the 25th of the following October. He was buried in Westminster Abbey, and his tomb became a nucleus of what is now known as Poet's Corner. It is unclear how he died, and some have even speculated that he may have been murdered little is known about this great man's end. Even with such unique and varied life, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales praises the poet as the greatest English poet of all time, and the first to truly show what the language was capable of becoming. His work has influenced all to come after him. The work of Shakespeare, Marlowe, Edgar Allan Poe, Charles Dickens, and even author J.K. Rowling credits Chaucer as a strong influence. A very modest plaque was placed at Geoffrey Chaucer's tomb when he died. However, 150 years later, in 1556, as a testament to his great poetic works, poet Nicholas Burnham constructed a more magnificent tomb in honor of the father and finder of our English language. Today, Chaucer's tomb still stands and hundreds of visitors pay him homage each day. His works and his unconventional creativity in the 14th century credit him with not only founding the English language, but for capturing the voice of kings and commoners alike.
have watched about Jeffrey Chaucer's biography and the um, you know, process of uh, country buried tales. Uh, now let's continue about Jeffrey Chaucer's work. Now uh, Jeffrey Chaucer uh, known as the first English author and the Chaucer wrote in English at the time when Latin was considered uh, as a grammatica or a language which would not change and the most of upper class English spoke French. Chaucer himself often uses French translation of Latin texts that he chose the language of the lower class Saxons rather than Norman the Balti has perplexed readers and the scholars for centuries. As Sir Walter Scott pointed out, the Saxon language can name only barnyard animals on the hoop. If one uh, for the domestic animals they use it, its Saxon name, uh, sheep, but if uh, one ate it, they likely called it by its French name, Mountain, which soon became uh, Mutton. This linguistic distinction was a class distinction in a chosen England. If one raised a farm animal, one was a Saxon and called it by its English name. If one were rich enough to eat, if one raised a farm animal, the Saxon and called it by its English name. If one were rich enough to eat it, one named it in French, like a calf, a veal, chicken, pollard, pig. Pope Chaucer didn't try, however, to impress uh, his relatives with his French, but began to develop English into a highly flexible literary language. Jeffrey Chaucer's first major work, The Book of the Dashes, is an elegy on the days of Blanche. John of Gant, his first wife, is a poem so filled with the traditional French. Uh, flourishes developed its originally around the relationship between the narrator, uh, a fictionalized version of the poet, and the mourner, the mean, the man in black, who represents Gant. Chaucer uses a knife narrator in both the Book of the Dashes and the House of Fame, which employs a comic version of the quiet narrator relationship. Of Dante and Virgil in the comedy, the talkative uh, eagle guides the uh, knave, Chaucer just as a native Dante is guided by the Gospi Virgil. The eagle takes Chaucer to a house of fame, which is even more the house of tales. Uh, here, Chaucer makes a case for the Preeminence of story and explored to great effect in the Canterbury Tales. The inhabitants of the House of Fame ask it whether they want to be great lovers or to be uh, remembered as great lovers and all choose the latter. The story is more important than the reality. In Chaucer's work is difficult, but scholars generally assume that his dream vision uh, poem, The Parliament of Birds, uh, it was written between 1378 and uh, 1381, which is uh, less obviously tied to source text or events, is his third work became, uh, because it marks a shift in form. He begins to use the seven line. And some stated that he would uh, use the trellis and the trellis and the crusade. And the bird is an indigent as an uh, allegory with birds corresponding to social classes. The hunting birds represent the nobles, the warm eaters represent the bridges, the waterfall as a um, Merchants and the seed eaters as a landed farming interests. Each class is given a distinctive voice. The element of words, Chaucer uh, examines the themes, 
that will uh, pervade his later work, the conflict between nature and the cult of love will permit uh, trailers and the crusade the experimentation with different voices for the character and the social classes of birds prestigious the country tales. By thirteen seventy Foster was firmly involved in domestic politics and was granted the important post of controller of customs and taxes on hide skins and wool chose hard to keep the records himself as well as oversee the collectors. These were prosperous times for Chaucer. His wife uh, had gotten a large uh, annuity and they were living rent free in a house above the city gate at Algate. After visitors to Guinea and Florence in 1372-1373 and uh, to Lombardy in 13. 78. Chaucer developed an interest in Italian language and literature, which influences uh, his poem Toilet and the Crossite. Chaucer retold the medieval romance of doomed lovers, setting his epic poem against the backdrop of the uh, siege for Troy. The poem takes its storyline from Uh, uh, Tiny, uh, too, but it's uh, inspiration from Dante's love for Petrice, as told in the Confiteor, and from uh, Petrice's love for Laura's, uh, as manifested in the sonnets. Jeffrey Chaucer's work uh, was um, mainly a lot, uh, but the famous and uh, unfinished work is uh, Canterbury Tales. Uh, we have pointed out uh, about Canterbury Tales in the uh, video of uh, Chaucer's work. The Chaucer most famous work is the Canterbury Tales, also his familiarities with Italian literature. The unfinished poem draws on the technique of the frame tale as uh, practiced by Boccaccio in the Decameron, so it's not clear that Chaucer knew the Decameron in its uh, entirety. The pretext for storytelling in the Boccaccio is a plague in Florence which sends a group of ten nobles to the country to escape their blackness. For each of ten days uh, they each tell a tale. Each day's tales are grouped around a common topic or narrative subject. The tales, all 100 of them, are completed. The plague ends in Florence and the nobles return to the city. And the country tells innovates on his model in significant ways far from the being noble Chaucer's tale tellers run the spectrum of the middle class from the night to the pattern and the uh, summer and the tales are not told in the order the that might be expected from highest ranking pilgrim to lowest. Instead, each character uses his tale as a weapon or tool to get back at or even with a previous tale teller. Once Sam Miller has established the principle of cutting, each tale uh, generates the next. The Reef, who takes offense because the Millworth's tale is about the uh, uh, killed it, uh, Cackle that carpenter, the uh, been a carpenter in the youth, tells a tale about the 
как Людмила Рукцепитина, что его дочь из Бифлоуэд, а в многих из тайлов Submission of class became uh, become uh, the folk story. Chaucer's refusal to let his tale under uh, convention is typical of the way he handles family stories. He wants to have it both ways, and he reminds the reader of his constantly. In the nuns, Prayer's tale, for example, he argues both against an allegorical reading of tale. My tale is of a cook and for it takes uh, fruit and uh, lets the uh, church be still. Outwork in many of these tales is an important chosen device. A false uh, the logism based on the movement from the specific to the general back to the specific again. Although the specific now occupies a new moral ground, Almost every time Chaucer offers a list of examples, he's playing with the disparity between general and the specific. As Chaucer's uh, work it against the impossibility of finishing the contemporary field according to the uh, original plan, 120 tales for 12 by each of 30 uh, pilgrims in the Middle Ages which had many systems based on 12, 120 was this around a number as the 100 of the Decameron, he began to consider the nature of finishing an act of storytelling. In the Canterbury Tales, in addition to several unfinished tales, the cooks and the squirrels, there are two tales that are interrupted by other pilgrims. Chaucer's own tale of soaps and the a monk's tale. In handling these tales, Chaucer moves into issues, uh, particularly that of uh, closure, that in now important important to uh, narratology and the literary theory. Put another way, Chaucer worries both what a story can mean and what a story can be. In Considering the in considering the ramifications of the invented teller telling about as the invented tellers telling stories whose main purpose is to get back quite at other tellers. Chaucer finds himself with a new conception of fiction, one that is recognizable in modern and even postmodern. About uh, why um, Jeffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales unfinished? There is much uh, speculation as to why Chaucer left the Canterbury Tales unfinished. One theory is that he left off writing them in the mid um, 1390s, some five or six years before his death. It is possible that enormousness of task overwhelmed him that he couldn't uh, unfinish it, uh, he couldn't uh, finish it, his work because of lots of work overwhelmed him. He had been working on the Canterbury Tales for 10 years or more and he was not a quarter through his original plan. He may have felt he could not divide his time successfully between his writing and his business interests. Chaucer himself offers an explanation in the retraction which follows the person's tale, the past of the Canterbury Tales. In it, Chaucer declaims apologetically all of his uh, impious works, especially the tales of Canterbury, like that, uh, so interesting. Uh, there has been some uh, speculation about the retraction. Some believe that uh, Chaucer in the ill health confessed his uh, impeaches and others that retraction is uh, merely conventional. Chaucer taking on the uh, persona of the humble author stands forward in the Middle Ages. If the reader is uh, to take Chaucer at his word, he seems to suggest that his works 
were being this with that people were mistaking the sinful behavior in the country tales for its message.